Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the C-Mask podcast. And today we are talking about whether it is right for women to vote. It's been a hot topic over the week in online discussion. Tim, tell us a bit about some of the different sides to the debate that you've spotted online over the past week. Well, I think I think it's been reinvigorated over the last months by pearly things online. Pearl has uh, made, taken to making t-shirts that say like repeal the 19th. And this of course angers the normies. We're going to discuss the morality of it today, but the way I could tell this week online, I think Trent Horn was responding to the the toxicity of some of Pearl's minor throwaway points like th that we've addressed a million times here on CMAS. Can can anyone, men or women, cheat? We say it's it's obviously wrong for men or women to cheat or fornicate. Duh. Uh, you don't need to do a whole show on that. But through that Trojan horse, I feel like um, Trent was maybe trying to sink his teeth into some of the, the bigger points about which we would agree with Pearl. And I didn't watch the whole thing, but in his com box, he was getting into it with um, Twitter commentators like Christian Wagner about the female vote and Christian Wagner was making some nice points. And I, I thought uh, Trent, once again, I, I mean, I've debated him on Christian feminism, had, had the wrong side of the equation that, that female voting is basically a good thing. My comment that is not something we need to spend much time on today is just like, unless it's an a priori human right, a natural right, which voting is not for men or women, then it's a posteriori and you can simply look to statistics and utility and the, the principle of, of uh, you know, what's most convenient. And in America, well, uh, vote, female vote has been catastrophic for our little republic. So that, that's all I weighed in on so far. I think you have the much bigger point than we were talking about before the show. Yeah, well, let's talk about this because there's no official church teaching on what the the best form of government is right there's no pronouncement from the magisterium saying you must go with a democracy it's been left open for individual thinkers working within the flexibility that catholic social teaching allows to make the case for different forms of what the best state should be and tim's made the point here that we can look at the consequences of extending the vote to women and say, you know what, based on what we've seen, this isn't a good idea. And a lot of people feel this way, including pearly things. And she's been articulating that as Tim's explained, what are some of the ways then in which we think the female vote has been disastrous? I'll start off with one, which is what it's doing is affirming the idea that people are fundamentally atomized individuals and rather than having the family vote, which the husband, the father as the patriarch makes for everybody under his authority, he makes the correct decision for the house. He also has a wage, which is the whole family's wage too. It's not like he has a separate bank account that is just for him, like pocket money. And then his wife, isn't working outside the home. She doesn't have her own separate money either. Similarly, what's the sense in them having two separate votes? If they are one flesh in marriage, they should be a union of wills as well, and they should be on the same page politically. So by saying a woman needs to vote, you're also saying that she is somehow independent from her family. Her true identity is as this separate thing. So the household vote, one for the family was a commitment to family as the bedrock of society, not just two separate individuals. That's what I'd come at it from. People who say that the female vote is so important are also saying that liberalism, the individual versus the family, is somehow fundamental. Elliot, what do you think? Well... The idea that women are not voting when they're not casting ballots is bullshit. Women vote every day with every ounce of her being, and that's why men are what we are. Women vote with their sex and submission. And so at a root level, women are 
really ruling society and voting with those deeply important things to the unit of the family. And the man, his vote with, that they're fighting for, they think they want, is the fruit <laughs> of that plant. And you might say it's a bitter fruit because it's just something that we have to do. It's a, it's a responsibility, we're citizens. And so we, in order to make this clock tick, it's a good idea to have these kinds of votes and stuff. But it's no sweeter than getting to choose who you have sex and submission with. And then, as we call our lady, the mediatrix of graces, there are those, and I wouldn't disagree, that say that woman is the mediatrix of decisions that men make in the home. I choose the home that I'm living in is because my wife loves this home. You see what I'm saying? And so ha, they yield more power than they've been told and so they're fighting for our scraps and it's silly the whole thing is a hoax that's a really good point because what you're telling women is that until you have this magical thing called the vote you are powerless true power is the kind of power wielded by the tiny minority of men who until the first reform acts uh, actually had a usable national vote you're dangling it out to women and saying, this is it. What you have right now isn't enough. But if we look back historically, then everyone had a say in how their own communities were run at the local level. So women always had the vote, uh, parish and manor level. They could decide what was happening in their communities. And you can think of this on a really small scale, as in the, the Women's Institute. Who knows what's going on with the gossip in the community? Who's exercising political sway on that small scale? Like Elliot says, a lot of the decisions are going to be made by women. And feminism is misogynistic in the sense that it doesn't value that kind of power that's rooted in the sphere of the family and the local community. They want women to be the big bosses in the boardroom and calling the shots at the high level, which is where the man's role is. And that's why women's vote is connected to feminism. Nick, what are your thoughts on the ways in which the women's vote has undermined the Republic of America, as Tim brought up a couple of minutes ago? Tim, you'll know the source on this quote, so please uh, remind me of it. But <clears throat> one of the things that I find most humorous about this egalitarian approach to voting is that it's trying to declare that men and women are the same thing that we are identical. And uh, the quote was something to the effect of the difference between men and women is far deeper than the difference. The difference between sexes is far deeper than the difference between races. Tim, who said that? Uh, Pius the Pope, 12th. Some, thank you. Pius, Pius the 12th. And if, if that's the case, which it is, then just look at the um, effort put in to get the correct demographics in the correct areas to facilitate certain votes. This is why we have such a debate about immigration, because we know how certain demographics vote. We know this. And if you're telling me that there's a, a, something even deeper, even more profound about men versus women and how they vote, then it makes a whole lot of sense to separate the two and then tell them that they are um, the same type of thinking entity that will produce the same or uh, equivalent caliber of decision when given all of the same resources and opportunity. This obviously isn't true. And rule number one of feminism, again, referring to what Tim has articulated before, is never offend a woman. And so once you then give them this platform and these equal opportunities, then all of a sudden you have to make policy changes to not violate rule number one of feminism. And when Tim and I talked about um, uh, abortion on his last show, um, it it was demonstrative of that. You know, we now live in a gynocentric society where uh, women have the freedom to get their ass in a car, drive to an abortion clinic and murder their child without consulting their husband. And the husband will never have a right over that child. And the list goes on and on with family court and so on and so forth. So similar point then in that 
the idea that women need the vote is rolled up with this whole paradigm of liberalism that a a classical approach to society would reject because the family is the building block and you also don't get to decide what your individual human rights are these aren't things that you magic out of thin air you can't vote for the right to abort your child for example that's a good point nick but it's interesting that most men couldn't vote either i think the bigger question here is about democracy itself we've hinted at it a couple of times here with the remarks already but i think it was two percent of men around two percent of men could vote before the first reform acts in 1832 and even i've got here by 1918 less than half of all men effectively had the vote and they were the men who fought in the great war they'd had no say at all so if you're talking about injustice I think what you've got there is the fact that you've got uh, taxation. You've also got conscription without any form of representation at all. So the idea that before women had the vote, women were the ones who were really discriminated against. They were the ones who were suffering most. No, you can make the case that it was the majority of men who had it harder. That point isn't often raised much in this discussion, is it? No, the point... No, the point of representation, uh, which was the rallying cry of the American Revolution, well, as you'll, you'll, all of us here will remember, uh, no taxation without representation, has always been used in favor of the female enfranchisement, whatever. It's like you say, it's ex the exact opposite. Now what we have is a, a gynocentric society and even a gynocentric geopolitics. Think about some of the foreign wars that are being prosecuted. Think of how uh, female the sentiments are uh, that are animating some of those foreign conflicts. I don't care whether you're Israel or America and you LARP as if women can, can play, play around in the military by playing walkie-talkies. The boots on the ground are men. And if you can script men into a war that you know you it's it's immoral to do so unless you're one of the guys that's going to go be fighting that battle so it until i read that quote that you sent over this morning i hadn't thought that this is which it is the absolute best argument against the female vote that the i'll just i'll just read that quote that i got from you if you don't mind hold on tim How i just got a delivery i'll be back in a second but yeah read it out i know the quote see you in a second cool uh no worries helen kendrick johnson writing in 1913, after doing a, a survey of the women's suffrage movement in the United States, in a discussion of the claims and arguments of its foremost advocates, wrote the following thing. Democratic government is at an end when those who issue decrees are not identical with those who can enforce those decrees. Not necessarily who do enforce them, but who can, generically. Upon this dependent stability, and without stability there's nothing, Stability required a majority of men. Women's only relation to this defense is that of beneficiary. And therefore, her relation to the laws with which that defense is associated must be one of advice, not control. Now, lots of uh, bleeding hearts in America have said for years since Vietnam, uh, widely repeated in the second Iraq war, that a lot of the senators voting to go to war or supporting war, maybe one they didn't vote for, like the uh, second Iraq war, they're not going and taking shrapnel in the ass. And this is, this is a good point, right? It's a, a reasonable point, but it doesn't carry the same force that it does as the generic divide between men and women. A, a woman who votes for a president that's likely to go to war, or a woman who were to vote for war if it were some sort of special referendum will never, generically, never be really risking her own ass or her daughter's. So that's, that's where this quote uh, carries special force. What do, you, what do you guys think of that? It's, it's different from just the, the rich aristocrat senator and his son who are basically safe. Uh, that, that, you know, technically, that guy or his kid could always be conscripted if things got desperate enough. 
But generically, we know that in our society, women will never go and cash the checks that, that our asses write, to use the old expression. That's yeah. because it's a hoax. It's a hoax. It's a trick. It's a sleight of hand. It's a silly game. And when you pointed out Israel and the U.S. playing the game, that's exactly what it is. Uh, ideological subversion. It's a weapon against our society. It's the errors of Russia, right? And so, you know, even sometimes I even feel silly having these kinds of conversations, but, you know, I really enjoy hearing you guys talk about it. But it's like, how, do you, how would you say? It's like trying to solve the problem with which, at the level at which the problem was created. Like, we're, we're, we're using their language and we're, their, we're on their battlefield. Uh, yeah. Rather than yeah. recognizing the whole thing as, as, as farce and false, and drawing a picture for what's true. And I guess that's what we're doing here, right? Which is that women's place is powerful in society, so much so that it is the roots. And that this whole grab, this whole power grab up top is rotting for everybody. It's not good for women. It's not good for men. It's not good for society. It's not good for families. But the, the, uh, the, the hoax is so deep. The trickery has well done what it intended which is to collapse our society. Yeah, that, that quote, I think probably subliminally is what inspired my comment, Tim, which is the, the women are the beneficiary. Women's only relation to this defense is that of the beneficiary because they're not the same thing as a man. They're, they're a woman. And it seems like the question, I mean, it's, it's, it's almost stating the obvious to a patronizing degree, but a lot of these things are so revelatory that it bears just explicating them word for word that first wave, quote unquote, feminism and the women's suffrage movement was a declaration that there is no difference between a man and a woman. They are the same thing. They can do the same thing. And the, and the currency by which we are now going to be identical is that of controlling the ship that is our country. Right, right. Yeah, I, I do think that this is, this is where as much as I, I've, I've said, I tell people this, you know, I actually didn't touch on women's suffrage in the case for patriarchy, which is like, passes itself off as the definitive anti-feminism book. The only place I touch upon it is, of course, it was the, the figurehead, the uh, Raison d'etre, if you listen to popular accounts of first wave feminism, for first wave feminism. And I always say, no, this is, this is bullshit. If you look at first wave feminism, it has all the five, five most negative aspects of sex revolution, second wave feminism, and they're all there in the 1848 uh, document from uh, the, the Seneca Falls Convention, memorialized as uh, Declaration of Sentiments. But, but yes, most people have been brainwashed that the female vote is what's holy and shining and uh, justificatory about first wave feminism. And of course, you, you said it there, Nick, it's, it's not actually, it doesn't actually justify as it is. If this is the best reason to affirm first wave feminism, then it's it's not much at all because it is dysphoric inherently yeah yeah <laughs> inherently dysphoric sorry about that guys but i'm liking what i'm hearing so there's no good feminism bad from the first wave and it's inherently dysphoric and now we're living through the consequences is that a fair summary fill me in yeah yeah well in America, um, the, the, the popular narrative by blue pillars and by the mainstream media, left and right, is that even though all this bad stuff grew out of first wave feminism, like the sex revolution, I guess this is mainly what brainwashed right wingers say, it was good because the f first wave feminism was all about voting. And the, the female voting was not only inevitable, but it was only... It was morally inevitable. We, we had to get rid of females not having the vote. That's the way it was passed off to me and to, to Elliot and to 
Nick and to all Americans in school. And it's nonsense, of course, for, for the reason I point out in the case for patriarchy, the first way feminism was really about getting women out of the home, um, pushing women into the roles of clerics, turning men and women against each other and making women uh, sexually permissive, uh, promiscuous like men. And that, that's all there in the, the 1848 document. Basically the same four or five goals of second wave feminism. But also they tacked on this nicer sounding thing of the female vote. And well, for the reasons you guys have pointed out, female vote is inherently dysphoric. As red pillars often point out, it, they can't be uh, back to this point in the quote that, that we read about uh, uh, Ken, Helen Kendrick, uh, Helen Kendrick women cannot decree something and go and force it themselves in the home place, one-on-one, -on -one, in uh, a parish, in a uh, small polity like a municipality or in a, an actual republic. They simply cannot decree something and then go and force it. In the home place or one-on-one, -on -one, if a woman's yelling at another man, if she thinks he says something piggish, or in a parish, or in a city or in a state, that woman has to go get a man to enforce what she's doing. Feminism always depends ontologically, fundamentally on white knighting, right? And it's, it's, not, it's not lame, it's not pathetic or simpy for a husband to back his wife's play if she's dealing with the teenagers and they're being mouthy and she says, can you go talk to him? Or if a, a woman is being accosted by a man in public one-on-one -on -one, and another guy was like, look, I don't want to get in your guys' business, but, but you know. You, you, you gotta, you're going to have to have this argument someplace else, at the very least. You guys can't be yelling at each other here. You can't yell. Or, or in a municipal, state, or federal government, if a, a woman wants to go, you know, in fly the Leviathan flag, you know which one I'm talking about, the Skittles flag, on the American embassy, well, the woman doesn't have to go enforce it and put boots on the ground in Eastern Europe or Ukraine or Russia or whatever. Right? Those are men that are going to have to enforce it. So fundamentally, jointly and severally, individually and collectively, corporately, men are always having to enforce gynocentrism. So it's us. It comes back to the point that, that where we differ with the red pill. It's our fault. Men are the ones that are pushing feminism. At the end of the day, even if a lot of females are the beneficiaries, we are the ones allowing it and we're the ones enforcing it. Men who are white knighting on uh, anti-feminist type men. So I have a question then, because if that's the case, you know, if, if you sort of rewind your perspective to what I would imagine late 1800s, early 1900s, and there are some broads marching around in the street with wooden signs saying, you know, we need the right to vote. <clears throat> I would imagine that 999 men out of a thousand, perhaps more, if you ask them in your magic time machine, hey, what do you what do you think of this? They would all have roughly the same answer of this is nonsense. This is insane. This will never happen. We won't let it happen. But it happened. And it happened because at some point along the way, men abdicated. So my question is, how the hell did we abdicate that? Sex. Sex. <laughs> Sex. Let them all so? start fucking each other. Let them all have promiscuity. Let them have uh, the birth control pill, contraception. Let them get addicted to pussy. Yeah, if, if you look, um, there's some interesting research on this. When women have more political power more economic power they are freer with granting men access to sex because it's not anymore their main leverage for gaining access to resources so traditionally the way the woman gets the man to protect her and provide for her is by saying we're going to get married and then you get access to sex i'm yours you're mine and we're together as that family unit. But when she can get money, when she can get political influence without a man, she thinks, oh, well, 
yeah, I'll just have sex. And it's not so precious to me anymore. So in that sense, Elliot's 100% right. Feminism was the, the greatest honey trap or the greatest shit test, if you like, in history. The biggest one. And men <laughs> failed it. <laughs> so Nick, Nick's question is a really good way of thinking about it. We're going to push at their boundaries and we're going to see if these guys are really all about that patriarchal life. You want the trad life, you better have the trad wife to go with it. You can't have one without the other. And men thought, no, nah, you know what? I want to split bank account. Let her have the vote. Let her do things her own way. Give her the autonomy. And then maybe I'll get some sex before marriage. So I think that's how it played out ultimately. And we're seeing the consequences now. There's a great question, Nick. Well, also there's the political grandstanding for the way that I don't, I don't know tons about it. Cause I, I kind of, I treated it only de minimis in case for patriarchy, but the grandstanding in the public square, whether you're having private conversations or public converse or, or more public conversations through a bullhorn, um, when, the 19th Amendment was being debated nationally. This was like the, the, the platonic form of the time for white knights and simps and cucks to shine. Think about it. I, I can only imagine what it was, what it must have been then, you know, for when you're having a national conversation about an amendment to the Constitution, which represents all the simps and all of their hopes and dreams and their tiny little Four, four sizes too small hearts with their it, nine sizes too small uh, genitalia. The men that actually voted for this and grandstanded for it. It was their time to, to emerge. Uh, let all simps come forth when the 19th Amendment was being debated. It, imagine it was the, the way that national conversations are had. It'll be, you know, you're listening to the radio and you, you have a discussion with your wife over dinner you might have listened to the radio or, or read the newspaper and had your neighbors or your friends over for dinner. So you're talking about it with a couple husbands and a couple wives, or it might be you're having a loud conversation in public. This is the time where those guys evidently took, took the reins of power, took control, and were like, oh, my, well, you know, I, I have this Nietzsche and Rosanta mom. My wife doesn't think I'm a big man because I'm not a big man. This, this, it's the same that simping works today. I'm going to say in a loud voice, I think you should get the vote, honey. I can only imagine it. It's legendary. Well, in 1920, you know, this, this takes effect. I just can't imagine. Like we came off of a world war. And the most badass dudes in the world coming back with shell shock after having killed, you know, like half of the global population or something insane. And they go, you know what, you know, what would solve like all of our problems? You know, it would hurdle us toward world peace and economic growth is just like women. We just need so many women giving us their opinion right now. Hey, like, hey, I just hey, can't believe now. it. They, they were, they did. That was fed to them. Because when the men by who Elliot nine, when the men <laughs> oh, God, he's done it he's done it <laughs> when the men were off to battle they were campaigning for women in the workforce Susie Riveter you can use this heavy machinery just like a man. The men aren't here. Do your part. It's even like, you know, get the vaccine. It's like, go and work. Get up and work. We need you. It's, it's patriotic and it's liberating. Look, now you have the money. Husbands come back after getting their bodies blown apart. Many of them never return to a bunch of working girls. They turn them into whores while we were gone. They turn them into prostitutes. They taught women it is good to prostitute themselves for the tax man, whoever you want to call them. Yeah, a good movie for that is League of Their Own. Uh, it's a baseball movie. And yeah. it's a very, very charming film, but um, it does show what, what happens with women when the men are off at war. I think that one was 
what was that the 60s or the, no it was not it was the 40s so it was um world war ii and yeah the men are off fighting and the <clears throat> the uh we'll just say the businessmen thought it was really important to keep entertainment going specifically america's pastime baseball and well phew, Guy, guys aren't here anymore. So what are we going to do? We're going to put women in short skirts and they're going to run around and pretend to be men and then hit the ball. And then what always happens, what every single time happens when you put <clears throat> women in the domain of men, even though it's a farce to everybody who has facilitated it, is the women take it seriously and they go, you know what? I am going to be the best baseball player of all time. I will be the best pitcher. In fact, I'm better than the guys. And so they all took it super seriously <laughs> until the guys came home and the, again, the, the businessmen were like, okay, you can, you can go now. But I think that that's a microcosm. That's a mini iteration of what happens probably thousands of times leading up to 1920 and then to present day. And it just serves to reprogram their minds until the women and then all of society is operating under the auspices of, yeah, they're, they're the same thing as men. They can do the same thing as men. And don't you dare suggest otherwise, or we will rip your head off. Let, let's talk a bit more about the role of money in this, because, you know, businessmen are ultimately just trying to make a profit and they look for markets that will enable that. So, yeah, you're right, Nick. The businessmen had a plan for sure, but there was a market for it. And a lot of it is about people's disordered desires creating that market. We don't want to go for a straight out victim narrative where we just point the finger and say, we were so strong, we were based and we had things under control. And then you ripped it out of our powerful patriarchal hands, you meanies, because in that case, you're just crying in the corner with your lunch money stolen. And it turns out you weren't so powerful after all. After the war, one of the motives for giving more men the vote was the necessity of spreading the cost, spreading the financial burden of the war across a larger number for the income tax. And what did they do to make that possible? How did the notion of citizenship get changed? Nick, before the stream started, you had a great stat about um, who counted as an American citizen originally. What were the criteria? Yeah, well, it was just the uh, the Naturalization Act of 1790 in the United States, which was that you had to be a white, white. landowning Christian man of good character in order to have the vote. And in that in early America, that was a higher percentage because most people were all of those things. Um, but the point is, is that even then there were stipulations on the men, which is you need to own land. So, you know what the hell it means to work and uh, tend, tend the land and actually can uh, cultivate part of the thing you're trying to run, which lends itself to that quote that, that you guys read earlier, um, that you're not just the beneficiary, you are the arbiter of the thing itself. Uh, and then of good character, you have to be a good person, which uh, up until recently was a, a pretty easy thing to know what that meant. Yeah, this is all sensible, right? Common sense. People need skin in the game to actually get the vote and have a say in what the future of the country is going to be. I've forgotten which of the uh, Greek or, or Roman political philosophers it was, but there, there was the notion that the, the father is the ideal citizen because he's connected to the past, present, and the future as well. And what you're describing there with the criteria for getting the vote originally is someone who's got skin in the game in all those ways, including being of good character. So you're not in it just for your own profit, for example. You care about the kind of world that your kids and your grandkids will inherit as well. So once they change that notion of what it means to have the vote to a universal one where property didn't matter, income didn't matter, even character didn't matter, then that is clearing the ground with the men, first of all, for extending it to women as well. And I think you're right. This wasn't something that men were marching around the streets voting for. It wasn't even something women, by and large, 
were marching around the streets voting for either. Most women weren't campaigning for this. It was something that was imposed top down. And we talked about this in a previous episode as well with Tim saying that we've got the, um, the CIA later on, for example, funding Miss Magazine. You got it top down much earlier on too. So it's a misconception to think that in a democracy, people get what they vote for. They're given what the elites want to give them. And the female vote, feminism more broadly, is a great example of that. One of the points that I made on uh, one of the earlier sea masks that you gentlemen were so kind to have me on was the idea of the market deciding and the, the capitalist incentive of this. Because we were looking at the alphabet people and things like the NFL or Bud Light. Um, and I started to notice a pattern, I think it was around 2020, which was that every single time the supposed capitalists made a woke play, they lost about like half of the net worth of their company. And that seemed to serve as zero warning to every subsequent company, whether it was the NFL or whatever, who decided to do the same sort of marketing. And I started to question, wait a second, these guys are supposed to really, really love money here. That should be, that's the only thing they're supposed to love is money. So maybe the market decided, the market decided that the market doesn't care about money. And perhaps it's the case that because they are the creators of the fiat, because they, they can just rewire the game however they want it to be played, whether it's with votes or financially, that they're playing a much worse game than we thought that they were playing. And that this isn't pandering because it makes more sense and they get more money if they pander harder to the 0.3% of um, alphabet people. But rather, they would happily annihilate trillions of dollars over the last century and a half to achieve this end. Yeah. Yeah. They'll, they'll take a loss to accomplish a goal and that, but that's still not the market. I will, I will say this, Nick, that's the way that the market's engaged upon by um, reasonable actors is as you know, in, in, in their own self-interest or whatever, it's the people at the top that might, might have more that might have illegal levels of control i think do have illegal levels of control and this is always this is always bound up in having a federal reserve right that, that, yeah that that, it, that it market illegal. that market was a market yeah i have a question yeah do you guys yeah. know what esgs are yeah the uh, sustainable goals so Correct me if I'm wrong, but the way I understand it is that it's tied to banking and in some way it's also, and for, it's for businesses, you know, like a lot of these people who you're asking about, they're involved with this. It also has a social credit score. Like each company, as I understand it, has to meet certain uh, woke ideals in order for them to play this game, either it be getting money or something tied to banks. There's, and so you have an ESG, basically social credit score. And so a lot of these companies who know that they've got to uh, give in, am I getting cut off here? Uh, no, I can hear you still. Okay, I get my connection is a little weird. Uh, guy, these companies, you know, they have to give in in some way, maybe different ones at different percentages and uh, to, to, to different degrees, but they've got to, show the gang sign, right? They got to flash the sign. And that means, okay, I'm going to, I mean, I think it even happened with, uh, I don't know if this is, I'm making this up, but maybe I, I'm drawing too many conclusions, but uh, Chick-fil-A, which is a, you know, is a well-known Christian con uh, company here, um, giving money to a pro LGBT sort of um, halfway home, Right. Like, I don't know if that's a part of it, but you'll see things like that. Like, why is the LF NFL so gay? Like, yo, how did that happen? These are the toughest guys 
on the face of the planet, smashing themselves to pieces for our entertainment. It's the gladiators of the day, but they're wearing pink. Like, how did they get that? How they? And so, you know what? They started easily with the uh, breast cancer because breast cancer is a part of the whole same whole hoax. It's all part of the yeah. same hoax. And so they get these guys thinking it's cool to wear pink uh, socks. So you see it happens in degrees as well, right? Next thing you know, NFL is uh, transgenders is twerking at half times. <laughs> it's a great point about the breast cancer. That's very clever. Yeah. Oh yeah. We, we've been saying that for a long time. You get men to wear pink in the WNBA. They don't, they don't do something for November for men's uh, prostate month. Of course it's the white knighting is one way and it's in its top down. And I think, uh, Will, whether or not after this video is lived, you want to go through and, and bleep out the, the, the single <laughs> the single cuss word that will actually get us in trouble. Not, not saying fuck or shit, but... Um, will, I apologize. Yeah. I was provoked. No, no, I, was, me. I was... It was Nick. an alley-oop. I thought you were... No, I just... My first it's day me. on the job, please don't yeah. fire me. <laughs> Be careful. Be careful. Thank you. Uh, you can bleep it out. You can bleep it out as soon as it, it goes. That's that's the one cuss word that'll, that'll get everyone in trouble. But when you say businessmen, bankers, top-down control... We, you know, we're all, we're all, that's all a reference back to, to, to Nick and Elliot's alley oop from earlier. Um, <laughs> but, but it's true. I mean, it, look, it's true. Th these are tough guys. They don't, they don't care. In the 1980s, when I fell in love with the NFL as a, as a young boy, and I, I, I literally started rooting for the San Francisco 49ers because of their helmets, because I, I thought gold and red was cool. And I happened to glom onto maybe the best franchise ever. Uh, with Jerry Rice and Joe Montana. Lucky happenstance. There was nothing like this. Those guys being the kind of guys that would go to the NFL in the 90s and 2000s would have laughed at wearing pink, would have laughed at, uh, you know, breast awareness or whatever. Whatever. It's that it wasn't being top-down imposed yet by, you know, the, the bankers and the businessmen who, who do these things. So once they decided... To get back to the, the ESGs, what I, I think that stuff really began in proper in 1992. You know, the the, Rio. the the prep, the ESG, the sustainable development goals or whatever for, I guess that would be SDGs, for Agenda 2030, which is all about getting women more power. It's all about getting women in more professional sports. We've read the section on that on the show. Um, then, you know, these, these guys are... are to borrow a line from Apollo Creed, they're, they're stinkers. They're not thinkers. So they, yes, they're tough, but um, they can be manipulated into like over their, you know, muscles wearing pink. And they have been. And that, that represents a lot. Yeah, when you're Absolutely. willing to put money over honor, then it turns out you're not such a masculine man after all. And that's one of the ways in which the businessmen cucked the West because it was there for the taking. Tell me how much you'll give me to bend over and I'll think about it. Oh, that's not quite enough. Give me a bit more. I'm yours. That's how it works. And it's how it works day to day with guys who aren't in the big league sports earning millions as well. It's little decisions that average guys make in their everyday jobs too. And I just want to bring this back to a remark that Spengler makes in the decline of the West, which is interesting. He says that liberalism consists in freedom of the intellect for every kind of criticism. That's the whole free speech thing. And no topic is off limits. And kids should be allowed to make up their own minds. And we can teach errors in faith and morals in the public school system. And we imagine that human beings are just going to be purely rational or logical and there's no kind of temptation to find the wrong ideas seductive because of original sin. Because there's no such thing as that. We can expose them to whatever ideas we like, total free for all. Not only, Spengler says, is liberalism freedom of the intellect for every kind of criticism, it is freedom of money for every kind of business. Freedom of money for every kind of business. Can I hear people whispering porn? Well, that's what the West is craving. That's one of the biggest, most lucrative markets 
that's around at the moment, billions and billions of dollars. And the businessmen saw that and thought they, they want it. They can have it good and hard. They can have it pumped 4K into their pockets on their little devices. We can get them addicted to it because they'll pay. And again, it's to do with the fact that sin is going to weaken a society. So I actually have interviewed uh, E. Michael Jones on this topic and uh, took the channel strike for it. Hopefully, Elliot hasn't got me another one. But it's important to talk about that topic. Even more important is to see it as a symptom rather than the cause, in my opinion. You can have people bringing that to your doorstep and say, I'm not paying. I'm not interested. We're strong enough to fight off that rather than saying, yeah, mainline it into our media and we'll pay. Yeah, that's what's funny about this whole feminism thing. And, and as, a, as a young guy who's becoming more keenly aware of, of actually how it's impacted me, not just on paper, like, oh, the feminist agenda has been pushed X, Y, and Z for these, but like it's affecting me, my life, my relationships, my aspirations as a young guy. Like you guys, you guys have, uh, you know, 15 years more wisdom seeing this. And I feel like I'm just being woken up from the matrix, you know, and wiping the goo off my eye. I'm like, holy cow, this is horrible. Um, but because it's all illusory, that n none of what's being foisted upon us is truly, um, it's not kinetic. Like if you offend a woman, you're not going to like get shot. You know, your house isn't going to burst into flames, at least not yet. These things aren't going to happen because it's all willful abnegation by the man. It's really actually empowering to take that word back from the wokes as a guy to realize this, that like, it's just a series of small courageous acts and you can literally overthrow all of this in your, at least in your own life, maybe not in the world, but at least in your own life that you can, you can reclaim the patriarchy in your immediate sphere. And that should jazz every guy. Absolutely. Every guy should be like, feel like he just took steroids. Like you can go do this right now. That's a great yeah. point. Nick, you were just staying with me and Steph for, for a little bit of time, a um, couple, couple weekends in a row. You know, Michael, uh, Dr. Robillard, who, who was here, he, he stayed with us for a month when you know, we were finishing writing Don't Go to College. And it's like, I, I, I know it would be the same if you went to Elliot's house or Will's house. This is a little enclave uh, uh from from the rest of the world how it operates you can set up your enclave men how you want this is why we say don't be nigtow don't don't hide away don't take the benedict option and wave the white flag go get a good girl set up a patriarchy in your own little home and in terms of the dictates of secular conservatism you can you can have your own little you can have your own little kingdom in terms of the dictates of the church for those Catholics out there listening. Yeah, Pope Francis might take away the Latin mass. You can't do anything about that. But the most important fixture in your life that keeps you, your wife, your kids on track is that household patriarchy. And it doesn't really matter what happens with the liturgy. Even if worse things happen with liturgy than just you have to go to a Novus Ordo every week, you can take control of your own life. It doesn't mean we have all the control. God's sovereign. God alone is sovereign. But you can take control of your day-to-day -day particulars. And then when they bitch about this and they act like they can't, oh, well, what can I do, man? It's too late. My wife runs the household. I set this up. It's like, well, you might be 18, 20, 25 years in. I don't know how to undo it. But the, the fact of the matter is for single young guys out there like yourself, young Nicholas, uh, yeah, Will, Elliot, myself all do form an actual non-LARPing, very real, functioning in real time template that, that, that you can set up your own little your own little kingdom that works very well with a happy man, happy woman, happy kids who are thriving. Yeah, that's it. And remember, boys bitch, men build. We're not wanting anybody to be sitting there miserable, crying in the corner thinking that there's nothing that can be done to come back from the mess that we're in today. That is 
what the the old school moral theologians called being pusillanimous, being small souled. We want magnanimity, being great souled, being willing to take on the biggest challenge before all of us today, which is acknowledging that patriarchy is ruled by fathers and feminism got started in the home, really. That's where men first lost control of society in the household. And then we want to rebuild things from there as well. Now I know why Elliot is wearing shades today, because he's bringing that heat. That's our super chat, Elliot. That's your 10 bucks for uh, the strike. <laughs> <laughs> that covers the strike. Telling- I paid you back. That's my reparation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, just bleep it out, Will. I, I, like, literally, when this stream ends. You, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You can it's look. fine. Yeah. Um, but can I make one point real fast? Yeah, yeah. It's just this chart I'm looking at. Ann Coulter's been making this point, um, the American political commentator, well, self, self, evidently self, uh, wittingly, post ironic because she's a female commentator. Uh, this is a chart of the elections, general elections from 1976 to 2016. I sent it to all you guys in our chat. Um, the people, percentage of people who voted Republican in those 40 years. It goes back much further than just 1976, where the margin, the gap between men and women who vote Republican, who voted Republican, was always enough to cover the spread in terms of the gap between total people who voted Republican and voted Democrat. Meaning, we would not, there's some debate on this point, I don't know how, because it's a simple math. We would not have had a Democrat president in this country, the de, de, de right? right? Um, since the early 20th century, I've seen two different presidents being the ones. I think I've seen three. I don't know how there's a mistake. But it's over 100 years. We would not have had a de president in America in over 100 years if women didn't have the vote. It's right around 100 years. So the point is this, this, this graph that I sent you makes it really stark. The people who are in top-down control of things whoever they may be they they do know that what they're doing you know they get they scare up the masses talking about when women men blah 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 it has the nice downstream effect of creating this war of the sexes which i think is is actually more important than than the ballot box in electoral politics blah 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 but they actually know that in in the in the primary sense, they have to be winning elections. They are in America. The closest thing party that represents them is the Democrats. And yep. so they, they now win half the elections because of it, because of women voting. And it has the nice downstream effect of women and men hate each other now because women think they're men. Which, which fragments the family, creates more social chaos. And then you need a stronger state to mop it up. And this is the irony. It's that the choice is always patriarchy or patriarchy for women. You can have it in the form of your husband or you can have it in the form of Big Papa with the state coming in and you are a single mother as part of the harem. That's the only two things that you've got. And Herbert Marcuse knew this really well because he called young women feminism the most powerful and potentially the most radical tool that we have. They, they knew that if you want to restructure things, you get control of the young women. Why? Because in a fundamental way, sex makes the world go round because it's the main motivator for most men. And if you can control that, then you can affect the family and the society is then an outgrowth of that. One point you guys might have made when I was dealing with the delivery is this one. But as far as I know, it hasn't been made yet. Um, the the campaigners, the the women who are often described as campaigning for, for universal suffrage, they weren't really campaigning for that at all. The thing they were after was actually the separate enfranchising of women. And that's because they saw them as superior to the uneducated mass of men. So the, the suffragettes are, are really part of the socialist idea and this is mainly driven by male intellectuals, but plenty of female intellectuals also fell for it, that it's the elites that deserve to have the say. And 
women can also be a part of that, which is why it's important to remember that feminism is uh, largely founded by male intellectuals, but it is subsequently fronted by women because that's all part of the, the packaging. Yeah. That's great. All right. It's been a pretty hot stream. I've got a lesson coming up in a minute, so I need to wind things up now. But thanks so much for all the laughter and all the facts. Elliot, thank you very much for the naughty comment as well. I appreciate the fact that we got the truth out there. I'll bleep it out before the stream goes live. We love you, Will. Yeah, sounds we're, good, man. We're very sorry. Well, this could be this yeah. could be the last show ever on my channel. That might be it now. Nah, it'll be all right. <laughs> you sound like a Debbie Downer now. Don't go cry. I know yeah. it's a charged topic for you. I know you got feelings around it. I apologize. I really do. <laughs> I was set up. It's just, I only said it once. The the beep is also funny. Will you 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 and Elliot are two of the most like upbeat guys I I know. So I I never hear either of you guys uh, sound like Debbie Downer. And so so are you, Nick. So you, no, you three. I I I I love you guys. Hey, all right, uh, guys. It's been good. Cool. Yeah, you gotta go. All right, peace. I love you guys. Take care. Yeah, peace, 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 Elliot. Bye, everyone.